Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our 16th lecture uh, in our course on general psychology. Uh, and in this lecture, we'll talk about motivation, uh, which is re certainly related to our previous lecture's topic of emotion. Uh, so here, we'll talk about why people do what they do. Okay, so what we'll do in this lecture uh, is look at motivation. Uh, in other words, we'll try to understand what causes our behavior, what makes us do the things that we do. Sometimes we're aware of the reason for our behavior, uh, a lot of the times we're not. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at some biological causes of behavior and how that relates to motivation. Uh, so some of our behavior is driven by physiological needs. Uh, some of our behavior is driven by sort of longer-term biological interest. Uh, and then, of course, there are also psychological causes for behavior. Uh, so we'll look at some of the uh, different ways that our behavior is influenced by psychology. Uh, we'll look at some of the different ways of categorizing uh, motivation when it comes to these psychological motivations. Uh, so what we're going to do is, is learn some about the history uh, of the study of motivation. So there's been a long history of trying to understand why people do what they do, uh, first in the field of philosophy, and then later in the field of psychological science. Uh, and again, we'll see how biology uh, influences behavior. So we have biological needs uh, in order to stay alive in the short term uh, and in order to pass our genes on in the long term. Uh, but the, both of those processes uh, have been influenced by evolution. Uh, and we'll also see when it comes to the more psychological causes of behavior um, that there's some complexity there, uh, that it, it's perhaps not as simple uh, as those biological causes. Uh, we'll also see that it, it's malleable. So what do I mean by that? It means it, 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 I mean it's changeable. Uh, so there are some subtle influences at work in psychological motivation, uh, and it's not set in stone, so to speak. Uh, our motivations can change over time. Okay, so first, of course, we have to ask what motivation is. Uh, and your book has a pretty good definition here. Uh, it is the, the psychological cause of an action. It's what makes us do the things that we do. Uh, and motivation has been examined uh, for a long time, going all the way back to ancient Greek philosophers like Aristotle. Uh, and, and Aristotle promoted uh, what's called the hedonic principle. Uh, and what hedonic means here is having to do with pleasure. Uh, if you've ever heard the term hedonism or hedonist, same root word. Uh, so the, uh, the hedonic principle is that people uh, tend to exhibit behaviors that give them pleasure or result in pleasure, and they tend to avoid behaviors uh, or situations that would cause them pain. And that's a fairly simple framework, it seems. Um, but can we really capture all of behavior uh, in terms of pleasure and pain? And psychologists, and I would agree, uh, say that, well, you'd have to really stretch the definitions of pleasure and pain to cover all of behavior. Uh, as we're going to see, a lot of our behavior is driven by physiological needs. And while if you let those, those needs uh, progress to a point where they become unpleasant, you might call that pain. But really, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of physiology behind uh, our behavior that doesn't actually get into the realm of pleasure and pain. Uh, also, psychological motivations exist, and are those really tied to pleasure and pain? Again, you'd have to have a pretty wide definition of these, of these ideas um, to be able to cover all of behavior. So it was a good start, uh, but perhaps not as good a framework as, as, as was later developed. Uh, and then along comes William James, who we've run into many times before in our course. Uh, and he came up with the idea of instincts. And instinct is a word we're familiar with, and it has a, an idea of automaticity, that behaviors are, are automatic in some way. Uh, and, and that is built into James's definition of an instinct. Uh, there's the idea that uh, instincts do not consider consequences. So if, if a behavior is instinctual, uh, it, the individual doesn't consider what's going to happen if they exhibit that behavior, they just exhibit it. Uh, and so these behaviors are sort of hardwired. 
uh, they don't get a lot of consideration in the moment. Uh, the other component of James's definition of instinct uh, is that it's not experienced. It's, that doesn't have to be learned. So again, the sort of automatic ingrained idea uh, that instincts cause behavior, but they don't involve deliberation, deep thought, uh, and they don't involve learning or experience. Uh, so that was a good start, again, but the trouble is that instincts were a bit vague, uh, and the problem was trying to explain all of behavior uh, result, as resulting from instinct. Uh, and so James and his colleagues, in trying to explain all of human behavior, came up with a list of thousands of instincts. And of course, that's not a very parsimonious theory that becomes unwieldy pretty quick. Uh, and so perhaps trying to explain all of behavior in terms of instincts wasn't a very good framework if you need thousands of instincts to try and explain everything. Uh, so the behaviors in particular didn't like the ideas of all these, these instincts. Uh, and they came up with an, an alternative idea, and that was drives. Uh, and what a drive is, is, is an internal state that's caused by something physiological. So now we're getting into a more technical definition. There has to be something physiological a physiological going on uh, in the body that motivates behavior. Uh, that's why behavior changes over time. The state of the body changes. And so that can, that can cause a change in behavior. And this feeds into the idea of homeostasis, uh, which is the tendency uh, for the organism to maintain some desirable state. Uh, that some states of the body are more desirable than others. Uh, and so homeostasis is the tendency to move toward that desirable state. Uh, and on a related note, there, there's what was put forth was what's called drive reduction theory. Uh, the idea that what we really try to do when we behave uh, is reduce those drives. Uh, so if our internal state gets away from that optimal one, uh, well, that's going to generate some sort of drive, and behavior uh, tries to reduce those drives, tries to alleviate the, those physiological states that, that differ from the optimal one. Uh, and so if you're hungry, that's because you have an optimal physiological state of having energy available to the body. Uh, as you deplete that energy, you get further from that optimal state, uh, and so there is a drive to consume food. Uh, and to replenish the body's energy, to get back uh, to that optimal state. Uh, and so that's an example uh, of drive reduction theory in action. Uh, as your book points out, uh, the terms instinct and drive aren't used as much in psychology anymore. Uh, but we shouldn't take that to mean that they aren't useful concepts. Uh, certainly there are automatic behaviors, instinctual behaviors. And certainly our behavior can be influenced or driven uh, by physiological states. Uh, so those terms aren't in, in favor as much as they were, uh, but they're still useful ideas. Uh, later on, a psychologist named Abraham Maslow developed what's called the hierarchy of needs. Now, this is a fairly simple idea. Uh, the idea is that we prioritize our needs. Uh, so we have very basic physiological needs like acquiring food and water. And when we have other needs that are more psychological, like developing social relationships, having friends and family. Uh, and there are really high-level cognitive needs, uh, like the need to improve oneself through experiences or education or what have you. Uh, but the idea is that you don't worry about those high-level needs if you are, need to be concerned with those low-level ones. Uh, People that are starving to death don't worry about how, uh, how educated they are at the moment, for example. Uh, and so that's the idea of the hierarchy, that these kind of uh, priority uh, that's associated with them. Uh, and one of those physiological needs uh, is hunger. Uh, and so actually the need is for food. Uh, but hunger is our signal that we need food. Uh, and here, we'll see this theme come up again and again. Uh, that this is a physiological need that's signaled by hormones. Uh, and hormones are chemicals that are created by the body and circulate around in the blood, uh, and they can influence behavior. Uh, 
Uh, so in this case, the hormones of interest are ghrelin and leptin. Uh, ghrelin is kind of the hunger hormone. It's secreted by your stomach uh, when you need to take in more food, and your stomach will continue to secrete it until you eat something. Uh, once you do that, once you start digesting the food and nutrient levels in the blood rise, your fat cells can detect that, and they'll start secreting leptin. Uh, and so leptin is often referred to as the satiety hormone. Uh, satiety here in the sense of being sated or satisfied. You're full. Uh, and so we have this back and forth, these opposites, ghrelin and leptin. And they both are detected by the brain, uh, and the brain then changes behavior accordingly. Uh, and an important part of the brain when it comes to hunger uh, is the hypothalamus. Uh, so the hypothalamus has various parts to it. Uh, but it turns out, depending on which part of the hypothalamus you lesion, that is, you destroy, uh, in, in an animal like a mouse or a rat, uh, you can either wipe out hunger, not that the animal doesn't need food anymore, but it doesn't perceive hunger, or at least it doesn't try to satisfy that hunger anymore. So it will literally sit there and starve to death, even if food is available. Uh, but there's also another part of the hypothalamus uh, that if you lesion that component, uh, then the animal never feels full, will, will gorge itself uh, until it becomes sick. Uh, and so clearly the brain has a role to play in detecting these hormones and generating the appropriate behavior. And that brings us to eating disorders, uh, obviously related to hunger and taking in food. Uh, so two of the most famous eating disorders are bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa, often just called bulimia and anorexia. Uh, and bulimia nervosa uh, is characterized by binge eating followed by some sort of compensatory behavior. What does that last term mean? Uh, well, it, it means that the person compensates for the binge eating. And this comes in a variety of forms. Uh, the most famous might be intentional vomiting, uh, but exercise, uh, laxatives, uh, these are all ways of, of compensating for that binge eating. Uh, and then, of course, there's anorexia nervosa, which is the uh, fear of being overweight, the perception that one is overweight, even when one is not. Uh, and, and these are both fairly common disorders, uh, but they seem to have genetic roots uh, as well as developmental roots, uh, things that have to do with experience, things that have to do with genetics. And then, of course, there is obesity. Uh, which is a growing problem around the world, not just in the U.S., although certainly uh, in the U.S. it is a problem. Uh, and evolution has a part to play here. So we evolved under circumstances where food was fairly scarce. Uh, food was hard to acquire. You actually had to expend a lot of energy to get food. You had to go out to hunt or gather. Uh, and so evolution... Uh, biased our behavior toward preferring high energy foods, that is, food that has a lot of calories in it for a small volume, uh, and we also evolved the capacity to store excess energy uh, in fat. And so our fat cells are kind of like little storage tanks. Uh, they hold that extra energy until we need it. Uh, but of course, the world we inhabit now, uh, food, at least in the developed world, Food is, is fairly plentiful, especially uh, energy-rich food, not necessarily nutrient-rich. Uh, so just because a food, has a, a food item has lots of calories uh, doesn't mean it's necessarily good for you. That doesn't mean that it's nutritious in other ways. Uh, but we've evolved under very different circumstances uh, than those in which we find ourselves now. Uh, and so we still prefer high energy-density foods. Uh, we can still store excess energy in terms of fat. But because food is so plentiful, because energy inside the food is so plentiful, uh, we've started to develop an obesity problem. Uh, and so there are psychological influences here at work as well. Uh, your book has a fa very famous experiment uh, in which people, uh, given a bowl of soup, uh, they, they don't eat the soup based on their nutritional needs. Uh, there's a perceptual component. So they will eat the soup until the bowl is empty. Uh, 
and the experiment here was really clever. Uh, they had some people eating a bowl of soup and some people eating a bowl of soup uh, that could refill itself from the bottom. You couldn't tell that there was more soup being added constantly. Uh, and so people would eat as much as was available in both cases. Uh, but obviously, in the refilling bowl case, uh, they would end up eating much, much more. So our, the amount we eat isn't necessarily uh, tied to our internal physiological state. Sometimes it's tied to our perception. Uh, and there are ways to combat uh, obesity. Things, uh, things like being able to count the number of food items that one has consumed. Uh, oftentimes we'll eat without really thinking about how much we've consumed, but if there are reminders of how much we've consumed, then we can slow our eating. Uh, or if there are healthier options available, um, then we might not have as much of that unhealthy item as we would have otherwise. So psych psychology has both a negative and a positive part to play uh, in the onset of obesity. Okay, so hunger is an obvious physiological need. Um, what, what's a less obvious physiological need uh, is sex. Uh, and of course, sexual behavior, strictly speaking, is not required for survival. Uh, the organism can survive just fine without exhibiting sexual behavior. Uh, but the organism's genes can't. So in order for those genes to propagate themselves, uh, the organism that, that's carrying those genes needs to exhibit sexual behavior. Uh, and so, Again, if physiology becomes an important component here, and in particular, uh, this process of sexual behavior and sexual desire uh, is influenced by hormones. Uh, and hormones like DHEA, which is not very famous, uh, the long form of the name is not important, uh, but DHEA seems to be involved in the onset of sexual desire. Uh, not the onset of puberty, mind you. Uh, puberty happens in early adolescence, tends to happen earlier for females than for males. Uh, DHEA and its role in sexual desire uh, occurs earlier. Uh, so a few years earlier, in fact, and seems to occur around the same time for both boys and girls. More famous is estrogen. Uh, and in many mammals, estrogen not only controls the female reproductive cycle, uh, but also is the cause of female sexual desire the tendency to engage in sexual behavior. Uh, this isn't true in humans. Uh, estrogen still is a big player in the reproductive cycle, uh, but it turns out the testosterone uh, is actually a key player in female sexual desire. Testosterone is, is of course, more famous for being a male hormone. Uh, we should be careful here, though, because uh, estrogen and testosterone are produced by both sexes. It's just a matter of how much for each. Uh, also, estrogens are technically a group of hormones. Uh, we're not going to worry about that too much here. Uh, estrogen we'll just use as, as an exemplar of a single hormone. Uh, anyway, testosterone uh, is involved in male sexual development uh, and is also involved in male sexual desire. So here on the right is a figure not from your book, uh, but this is a study done in rodents uh, where they measure how much sexual desire, how much sexual activity uh, male rodents, in this case guinea pigs, exhibited. Uh, and there was variation there, just as there is variation in sexual desire in humans. Uh, what they then did uh, is remove the testes, which are, of course, the male sexual organ, produce testosterone. Uh, removing the testes eliminates sexual behavior. Uh, then the scientists reintroduced testosterone artificially by injecting it, uh, and then saw that these male guinea pigs exhibited about the same level of sexual activity as they did before. But it didn't really matter how much testosterone they were getting. There was a certain minimum level required, uh, but beyond that, extra testosterone did not increase sexual activity. Uh, so what this means is that a certain amount of testosterone is required, but we shouldn't think that more sexual desire is associated with higher levels of testosterone, necessarily. Now, as I mentioned, estrogen is involved in the female reproductive cycle in humans, uh, but it's not really involved in 
sexual desire, it seems, uh, or at least not to the degree that testosterone is. And now humans are not unique, but are rare in the animal world uh, in that we exhibit what's called concealed ovulation. So many mammals uh, will exhibit what's called estrus, uh, which is a period in which they are reproductively re uh, receptive. And this is accompanied by outward physical signs, often changes in appearance or coloration. Uh, humans don't have that. Uh, you cannot tell just by appearance uh, whether a woman is ovulating at a given time. Uh, and theories have been put forth as to why that is. But the most popular uh, is that if you can't tell when ovulation is occurring, if you are a potential mate, uh, then you don't know exactly when mating should occur. Uh, that is to say that mating pairs will stick together for longer periods of time uh, because the male can't tell whether the female is ovulating, whether offspring are possible. Uh, and so to cover that uncertainty, uh, the male will remain. Uh, that's the most popular theory. There are a couple others. We're not going to go into them here. Uh, and of course, we now know a fair amount about the human sexual response, which is not something we knew a lot about for quite a while. Uh, people are notoriously uh, reluctant to talk about their sexual behavior. Uh, and it took uh, a couple of scientists, Kinsey is a famous one, uh, but here, when it comes to actual human sexual response and sexual behavior, uh, here we turn to Masters and Johnson, uh, who are two scientists who did a lot of groundbreaking work on human sexual behavior. Uh, one thing they did was establish that human sexual behavior comes in four phases, called excitement, plateau, uh, orgasm, and resolution. Uh, so excitement uh, is the preparation for sexual inter intercourse. Uh, plateau occurs during intercourse, uh, involves things like an increase in heart rate, increase in breathing. Uh, of course, this is followed by orgasm, really increases heart rate and breathing. Uh, for males, involves the release of semen. Uh, and the, the timing, of course, can vary between individuals and between males and females for how long these these different parts of the the reproductive behavior occurs, uh, but also whether some of those phases occur at all, uh, especially the orgasm phase. Uh, after orgasm, there's, of course, resolution, where physiologically the body returns to normal. Uh, and there's also what's called a refractory phase, uh, where the individuals can't or won't uh, engage in sexual behavior again for a certain period of time. That can vary from minutes to days. Uh, but these are fairly characteristic parts of the human sexual response. Uh, and again, we would not have this knowledge uh, if not for some research done by Masters and Johnson. Uh, and it was not without its, its risks. And it, was, it took a long time, took a lot of hard work to get uh, this research done. Obviously, sexual behavior is, is an important part of our psychology, uh, an important part of our, of our evolutionary history. Uh, and it's only recently that we've really started to understand it. But of course we know that not all motivation is so biologically based. Uh, we also have psychological motivations. Uh, and one big distinction that's made here is, is intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Uh, if something is intrinsically motivated, if a behavior uh, is intrinsically motivated, it means that the behavior is in and of itself rewarding. Uh, so sex is an example. Eating is an example. Uh, food is a, is a primary reward. We talked in our unit on learning about primary and secondary reinforcers. Uh, extrinsically motivated behaviors are not rewarding in and of themselves. They are a means to an end. Uh, so for many, many people, uh, a job is extrinsically motivating. Uh, the work itself may not be rewarding, unless you are a food critic, perhaps. Uh, but you earn money by doing the job. And money itself is also not, not a primary reinforcer, uh, but it can be used to purchase primary reinforcers. So you work at the job to get money, 
you get, use money to get those primary enforcers. So a lot of work is extrinsically motivated. Uh, now, what's interesting here uh, is that sometimes our uh, our motivations can have both short-term and long-term components. Sometimes intrinsic and extrinsic motivations can fight one another, so to speak. Uh, so there's a really famous experiment done by a psychologist named Walter Michel. Uh, and what he looked at is delayed gratification, the capacity for a person to forego an immediate reward for a bigger reward later. Now, sometimes that those smaller and bigger rewards are in the same denomination or currency, so to speak. Uh, sometimes they're not. Uh, for example, when we are on a diet, we are faced with the intrinsically motivating piece of cake in front of us, uh, or we can stay on our diet, lose weight, and perhaps feel better about ourselves or look better, and that might be uh, extrinsically motivating. Maybe we need to uh, fit into some clothes we want to wear, or maybe uh, changing our appearance will help us in some way. So those can be extrinsic motivators, but it's very hard to overcome those immediate intrinsic motivations. And this was demonstrated really well and really entertainingly uh, by Walter Michel when he performed what is called the marshmallow test. And uh, this is where he had children come into a room and he places a marshmallow in front of them. Uh, and he or his research assistant says, okay, you can have this marshmallow now, or if you wait five or ten minutes without eating it, uh, I'll come back in and give you a second marshmallow. Now, for small children, three or four-year-olds, this is very hard to do. Uh, and these interactions were recorded by videotape, and I highly recommend uh, going to YouTube or finding a video of them, you can just search for marshmallow test uh, and you'll find the right videos. Uh, but it's, so, it's a lot of fun to watch these children and all the techniques they use to avoid the temptation to eat that marshmallow. They will stare at it, uh, they will intentionally avoid looking at it, uh, they will sniff it rather than eat it, or they will pick off tiny bits. Um, they use various strategies uh, in order to avoid that intrinsic motivation, uh, in order to delay gratification so they can have a bigger reward in the long term. Uh, and this, again, is, is not an easy thing to do, certainly for children, but even for adults. Uh, adults vary widely in terms of their capacity to do this, to delay gratification. Uh, but it turns out that uh, even in children, four-year-olds, uh, their ability to delay gratification is correlated with all sorts of interesting outcomes later in life. Uh, things like how well they do in school, uh, other life outcomes. Uh, and, and so this delayed gratification idea uh, seems to be really important, not just really entertaining, but it is that as well. Uh, now when it comes to intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations, uh, you can actually change from one to the other. Uh, there was a famous experiment done with daycare centers uh, looking at the rate at which parents would be late picking up their children. Uh, now, normally, there's no actual penalty for picking up your child late, uh, but people try to avoid it because it's not a nice thing to do. Uh, they want to follow the rules. Uh, they want to be a good person. Uh, and these are, to a certain degree, intrinsic motivations. What the daycare center then did uh, is impose a fine for coming late. They thought this would keep people from showing up late. In fact, it made them show up late more often. Why? Well, because they switched from an intrinsic motivation, being a good person, following the rules, uh, to an extrinsic one of money. And now people started to treat this like a transaction. Well, I can be late, and all I have to do is pay five bucks. So, or it was not done in the U.S., it was done in Israel. So it was shekels, but the point is the same. Uh, that, that switching to a monetary framework made people think of it uh, as a price. Uh, and so that is now an extrinsic motivation, and that changed how they behave. They started showing up late far more often. Uh, intrinsic versus extrinsic is just one distinction that's made, of course. Another is conscious versus unconscious. 
Uh, and we know what these terms mean, whether you're aware of something or not. Uh, and some motivations are accessible by our awareness, and some are not. Um, on a related note, there is what's known as the need for achievement. And this is typically unconscious. Uh, this is a motivation to solve worthwhile problems, uh, even if they don't provide an immediate reward. Uh, so, again, this is not performing a task so that you get a, a reward of food or money or whatever. Uh, this is the idea that accomplishing the task is in and of itself rewarding. And typically the task has to be challenging or novel in some way. Uh, but people vary in their need for achievement. Now, there's also a distinction between approach and avoidance. And this is another fairly obvious one. Uh, whether people uh, engage in a behavior and trying to uh, put themselves in a certain environment or gain access to a certain stimulus, or, or whether they're trying to avoid it. So is it a reward or is it a punishment in some sense? So when it comes to uh, approaching rewards and avoiding punishments, uh, there's an interesting phenomenon in human psychology known as loss aversion. Uh, and this is often summed up with the phrase that losses loom larger than gains. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that for some reason, uh, losing a certain amount of money, for example, uh, has a bigger psychological impact than gaining the same exact amount of money. Uh, so if I offer you the following gamble uh, in which I'll flip a coin and it comes up heads, uh, you gain $10, but it comes up tails, you lose $10. Very few people volunteer for that gamble, uh, which is surprising because on average, you would end up no different than how you started. Uh, but people tend to avoid an equal loss as compared to a gain. Uh, there was a study done, for example, uh, looking at the use of, of reusable grocery bags. Uh, and people were offered either a five cent bonus if they brought their own bags, uh, or they were assessed a five cent penalty uh, if they didn't. And you would think that that would not be a big difference. It is just five cents after all, and five cents gained versus five cents lost, would that really make, a, make an impact? But it did. Uh, the fact is that, that the loss version uh, had a much bigger impact on behavior. So when there was a five cent penalty for not bringing your own bag, uh, almost half the people started using their own reusable bags. Whereas with the five cent bonus, only about 15% started using their own bags. Uh, so losses have a bigger psychological impact. Uh, and this is very important, not just for monetary decisions, uh, but when it comes to how decisions are framed. So this is called framing. How you describe a decision makes a difference, even if the two outcomes of the decisions uh, are equal. The description matters. Uh, so this is from your book as well. Uh, if you're told that 600 students at your school uh, are going to going to pot or going to die if they don't get a vaccine, um, you have a decision to make. So you can either administer vaccine A, in which case 200 students will definitely live. Uh, or you can administer vaccine B, uh, where there's a one-third chance that everyone will live and a two-thirds chance that no one will live. So vaccine B is obviously a gamble. Either everyone lives or no one does, whereas vaccine A is a safe bet. Notice that we're describing things in terms of people living. So that's one way to frame it. And when you frame it that way, people tend to choose vaccine A. They tend to go with the sure thing. How about this description? Uh, you can, same situation, 600 students will die. Uh, vaccine C, 400 will definitely die. Versus vaccine D, there's a one-third chance that no one will die, and a two-thirds chance that everyone will die. So there's a gamble, again. People, when it's described this way, uh, overwhelmingly choose the gamble, as opposed to the sure thing. The sure thing of 400 people definitely dying does not sound that appealing. But let's look at these outcomes. 
Vaccine A and vaccine C have exactly the same outcome. 200 will definitely live is the same thing as 400 will definitely die when you're talking about a group of 600 people. So it's just a matter of describing it in terms of people living or people dying. In other words, of gaining something or losing something. Similarly, vaccines B and D are the exact same outcome. One-third chance that everyone will live is the same thing as one-third chance that no one will die. And yet that description has a huge impact on whether people choose the gamble or the sure thing. And so this influences, again, not just monetary decisions, but everything up to and including public policy. Uh, what's also interesting is that gain versus loss framing uh, is related to the need for achievement. Uh, people with a high need for achievement, that is, they're motivated to solve problems, uh, are often more motivated by the prospect of gains, and people with low need for achievement are often more motivated by the prospect of failures or losses. Uh, again, that is a matter of description. You can couch it either way uh, for losses or gains, uh, but the description matters. Uh, of course, one thing everyone tries to avoid is death. Uh, and this segues into uh, the idea of terror management theory. Uh, and this is the idea that uh, one of our big motivations is avoiding death, uh, avoiding even thinking about death, considering our own mortality. Uh, reminding people about their mortality tends to be unpleasant. People don't like to think about it. Uh, and terror management theory uh, is, is a theory that, that describes our motivations uh, in terms of avoiding death or even thoughts of death. Uh, and this leads into what's known as the mortality salience hypothesis. Uh, and here the idea is that one way of avoid, no one can avoid death, of course. Uh, some people avoid death by having children in, in a symbolic sort of sense, a genetic sense at least. Uh, other people avoid death in an even more symbolic sense, and that is uh, by belonging to a cultural worldview. So obviously there are different cultures in the world, they each have their own viewpoint, things they value, uh, and the idea is by belonging to that sort of community uh, that you are contributing something and that you are part of something greater than yourself that will survive after your death. And so in, in that sense, some part of you will live on. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that reminding people about their own mortality uh, causes them to cling more strongly to their worldview. So they will look down more on people that don't belong to their worldview. Uh, they will look down more onto, on at behaviors that don't coincide with their worldview. Uh, and so this, again, has an important part to play in things like public policy and politics, uh, where if there's some sort of threat, whether it's mortal or just threat of harm, uh, that people will tend to cling more tightly to their cultural identity and, and, see, and will view other cultures as alien or less worthwhile uh, to a greater degree when their mortality seems at stake. Okay, that will do it for our unit on emotion and motivation. Uh, next time, we'll look at psychoactive drugs, uh, which is obviously very related to motivation, especially when it comes to topics like addiction. Uh, so we'll look at different types of drugs. There are lots of different kinds of drugs that have different effects uh, on the brain, on our psychological experience, on our behavior. So we'll look at how that works, how drugs affect the brain, uh, and how those changes to the brain uh, alter behavior, both in the short and the long term. Uh, and in the long term, when it comes to psychoactive drugs, uh, there are concepts like tolerance, uh, concepts like addiction, and the treatment that's used for those addictions. So these are all part uh, of the psychology of psychoactive drugs, uh, and we will look at that in our next unit.